go. Excellent, excellent, and good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our uh, February twenty twenty third version of Beyond Black History Month. Um, this is is has truly become uh, uh, the premier program of our Minnesota Sala branch, and. Uh, couldn't be more proud of uh, Gene and Linda Crump and the Education Committee. They worked really, really hard to bring uh, just excellent content throughout the year. So I'm going to um, thank them, as I always do, and hand over the program to Linda, who will okay. do the lessons. And um, enjoy, please. You know, Thanks. David, David, I've never spotlighted myself. Does that work easily? We'll find out. <laughs> We'll find out right now. Okay, that spotlight. Good, so it's the two of us, so I can remove yours. Yep, you can. Thank okay. You. So bear with us, everyone. You can tell how good we are at this. But I'd like to welcome you all to the February Beyond Black History Month. And you can tell from the title of this presentation that we're going to be talking a little bit about Nicodemus, Kansas, a town in Kansas. And we're going to be talking about a production from the West Coast Coast Black Theater called Flying West, which is about Nicodemus, Kansas. So I'm going to turn it over to Gene. I'm going to go ahead and add him to this spotlight, and then I will remove myself. Thank okay. you, Linda. Uh, we're going to do a combined history lesson and a theatrical lesson about Nicodemus, Kansas, and the people who left Kentucky uh, to go to Nicodemus. And they went there with the expectation of a freer life, no Jim Crow laws, uh, no discrimination, no uh, bad treatment. And they just wanted to raise their families and have a good life. And the second part of the uh, January Beyond Black History Month will be with Chuck Smith, who was the director of Flying West, and uh, Jim Weaver, who was the education director of uh, Flying West. So I think we'll start in a moment. I'm gonna share my screen and put on a slideshow. Yeah, I, I don't have the video. I don't know how to do And that. we'll start. Uh, the settlement of Nicodemus was part of a greater movement of westward migration that occurred in the latter half of the 19th century. Several technological and cultural factors contributed to the growing trend of movement, enabling and encouraging new groups to move to the West. The Homestead Act of 1862 provided settlement op opportunities for people of modest means. A person could claim a 160 acre plot provided they lived on and developed the land for a five year period after which it could be purchased. In addition, the expansion of railroad network across the Great Plains increased both the accessibility and the economic opportunity of developing settlements. This is the plot that Nicodemus was raised on, grew up on, and flourished. And these are the remaining houses that occupy uh, Nicodemus, Kansas as of uh, 2016. I had the extreme pleasure of going to Nicodemus, Kansas in 2016 with a church member, Leatris Napiew, who was raised and was born in Nicodemus, Kansas and moved to Nebraska and attended Newman United Methodist Church. I'm gonna share my, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and move to a video. Yeah. Who's saying they can't see it? Oh, me. I have no idea how to do it. Judy here. He's going to try to show a video right now that the Parks Department put out. Right. And let's see if it comes up on your screen this time. I, I don't think it will because I don't think I did it right. I don't know how to get the screen. Just go out and come back in. I'll admit you again. 
Um, Make sure. <laughs> in 1877, 13 years removed when W.R. Hill comes up with this brilliant ideal to create an all black town. He puts it out there that there's going to be this black mm -hmm. utopia. You don't have to worry about Jim Crow or the KKK. You can have your own little community. When they get here, there's mm -hmm. absolutely nothing here but open prairie. It starts out as a struggle, but these people make it work. And Nicodemus is a bustling little town. So Nicodemus becomes this iconic place where you can look at how African Americans thrived. It speaks to the tenacity and the vision that African Americans had that left the South and moved to the West to experience freedom in a way they couldn't experience it in the Jim Crow South. It's important that people understand that the Black experience in this country is not just one of adversity. So when we talk about a site like Nicodemus, this thriving, bustling city coming after the Civil War, telling those stories are important. There used to be 40 such colonies like us in Kansas. We're the only one that still exists today. There is definitely an urgency to protect and preserve this story now while we still have it. So we have been having our emancipation celebration for 144 years. We get to come back to our roots. It keeps the town alive and we're able to pass this history down to our younger generation. Ever since I was about five years old, every summer we'd get in the car and drive back to next thing. As long as I had breath and strength in my body, I would be here every year for homecoming. Coming back every year was just vitally important. It has driven my entire life. It was never just a celebration. It was always about the family and how unique we were, that we could trace our history and that we had one time a year we could share that and no one had to explain anything. The Nicodemus story, even though I find myself a learned person, particularly around Black experience throughout the country, I didn't know about Nicodemus. It hasn't been written about. It hasn't been uncovered, so to speak. It's there. It's just that we've been neglected. If you don't see it in the movies, then I guess it's not real to a lot of people. Our grandchildren and children will see a perspective that is absolutely valuable to the fabric of America. You don't know where you're going without knowing where you've come from. It's really important to understand that the African-American experience is not just a Black experience. It really is the story of the United States of America. These stories help us understand the fullness of ourselves as a nation. What the Trust for Public Land is doing with the Black History and Culture Initiative is part of a growing movement to recognize and preserve Black history and Black culture. DPL has come in and they've worked with the community, with the township, and was able to purchase land so that a visitor center can be built. And now we have the beautiful exhibits, we have the AMU church that's been restored. We would be a ghost town without them. When we're gone, they'll still be here. This history will live on for our children to enjoy, to touch, to feel, to experience. I want to put more sites on the map that are preserved for Black history and culture. I want to be able to create sites that highlight self-determination, that highlight love, joy, all these universal values within the Black experience. Now I'm going to go on and share my slideshow. On April 18, 1777, a group of seven Kansans, six of whom were Black, established the Nicodemus Town Company. African American W.H. Smith and W.R. Hill an experienced 
white land speculator served as the town's first president and treasurer, respectively. <clears throat> Most of the group considered, consisted of former slaves from Kentucky in search of a new livelihood. The goal was to establish the first all black settlement on the Great Plains. Two theories explain the choice of Nicodemus. One claiming the town was named after the biblical figure Nicodemus. The other holding the town's name was inspired by a legendary account of African prince taken into slavery who later purchased his freedom. The location of the town chosen by Hill was along the North shore of the Solomon River, an area suitable for developing farmers. And the town itself was located on a 160 acre plot of the 19,200 acres of the township at large. Gene, if you can advance your slides, click escape on your keyboard and just show each one, even though it will be with the small ones on the side. You know, Zoom doesn't always work the way you want it to. Okay. Smith and Hill made efforts to promote the town and attract new settlers. Publications describing the resources and benefits of moving to the area were mailed to prospective migrants along in the early in the South. Early promotional efforts were directed toward attracting people with enough money to develop the town. Residential lots cost $5, while commercial lots were $75. The promoters charged an additional fee for establishing, for establishing the settlers on the land. Efforts, to, efforts succeeded in bringing great colonists from the East Kansas and Kentucky. At one point, the population reached about 600 people in 1878. In 1878, John Wayne Niles served as the second president of the colony. The early settlers found life in Nicodemus to be challenging. Some people turned around after seeing the scarcity of residences by mid 1878. Most were very poor farmers who came with money, without money, and others' provisions. Without provisions, without proper tools and equipment, such as a plow, wagons, and horses, farmers could not efficiently develop the rough land, and some resorted to using hand tools to make impro improvised fields. A lack of timber forced settlers to build homes out of prairie sod. To earn money, some people collected and sold buffalo bones found on the plains. Others ventured miles away for work for the railroads. In response to the hardships, town folk people reached out to other communities, private, grow, private charities, and even the Native American Osage tribe. There are currently five houses in Nicodemus that remain from the initial Nicodemus plots. And we'll talk about the five houses. The Township Hall Self-Government, and built in 1939 with support from the Depression Area Works Progress Administration, WPA. Programs using quarried limestone, the town hall served more than the needs of the local community. The building was used for community events such as dances, theater, live music, and occasional roller skating party. When Lee Napew, myself, and Linda went to Nicodemus for homecoming because they had changed the name from emancipation to homecoming, uh, the WPA town hall served as the center point for, for people coming in to get a Chautauqua type of uh, efforts and they had a series of quilts and, mm -hmm. and uh, artifacts and arts and crafts and they used the WPA project town hall to be their center for 
uh, Nicodemus. Built in 1939, okay, the St. Francis Hotel, Switzer residence, building and family life. Not only a hotel, but a home to the original owners, Zachary T. and Jenny Fletcher. The Switzers family moved in during the 20th century. The hotel served as the first town post office, the first schoolhouse and stagecoach station. The western wall of the building shows the limestone bricks that were brought over several years from Stockton, Kansas. Again, these are the early residences that aren't habitable and they're just the standing shell of the buildings that became part of uh, Nicodemus and the residences were built around them and they were taken down or torn down when they weren't uh, habitable. So all that remains in Nicodemus are the five houses. The historic First Baptist Church started, stayed, started in a dugout in 1877. The congregation continues to hold services today. As the congregation grew, the dugout was replaced with a Prairie Sod Church, a small limestone, and in 1907, the present historic building. In 1973, a big building to the north was constructed, which holds services today. The African Methodist Episcopal AME Church. The church was established uh, in 1878 on the other side, acquired the present building from Mount Pleasant Baptist Church in 1910. The AME Church was fully restored and rededicated in 2021 and is open to the public today. And these are the starting of the renovation, restoration, and reclaiming the African American Church. Again, uh, this church was built in and uh, housed the first AME Church and they say they built a new church to the west, but they restored the church somewhat. The first school was quickly established in the dugout of Zachary and Jenny Fletcher. A formal schoolhouse was constructed, becoming the first school built in Graham County, Kansas. It was later destroyed by fire and replaced by the present building. It was last updated August 21st, 2021. The Buffalo Soldiers were uh, a part of Nicodemus, Kansas because the residents uh, joined the services and they had reunions of the Buffalo Soldiers and it became a part of their homecoming displays and they were very important. It's not inexpensive to own a house and own a horse and care for a horse. The horses were used for the plows and things of that nature, but they always dressed up in Buffalo soldiers and they paraded down the main street of Nicodemus, Kansas. And I'll show you what they did. Okay, that wasn't. The Buffalo Soldiers are an important part of American history and Black history in particular. It was, it was housed in Nebraska at one time and they fought in uh, most of the wars uh, to and including the uh, Second World War and what became mechanized uh, branch was, is a forerunner of the Buffalo Soldiers. Yeah. Now, Nicodemus, Kansas, again, 
has one or two commercial plots and uh, Ernestine's barbecue is one of the plots and they serve uh, meals to the visitors for homecoming. Uh, they serve uh, ad hoc meals throughout the year, but they're not uh, an ongoing uh, concern. Uh, they're volunteers that work at Ernestine's and they do uh, barbecue, uh, they do chicken, they do turkey, and they try to maintain the prosperity as best they can. But it's difficult when the town uh, is really alive during the homecoming event in January for three or four days. When Linda and I were there with Mr. Napew, uh, we saw Ernestine's, we saw the arts and crafts about uh, what can be uh, learned from Nicodemus. Uh, there were African uh, quilts and African dashikis and African garb worn by the people uh, to uh, show their uh, heritage. And they really uh, enjoy the people who come to visit during uh, homecoming. And uh, it's a very good uh, uh, place. Mr. Napew uh, was a member of my church and had planned to be uh, talking about his experiences and experiences of his family, but he was not able to do it uh, today. And uh, we, we're trying to carry on for him, but he uh, was always missing from my church uh, the last two or three weeks in July. And we asked, where are you going? And he said, well, I go to Nicodemus, Kansas for homecoming. And he explained that Nicodemus, Kansas was an all black uh, colony that became a township and was prospering. And he was very disappointed because at that time, I think there were three railroads that tried to uh, build railroad stations. And as fate would have it, they were seeded uh, land. Every other acre uh, was the railroad's property and the odd acres were to be sold to create towns. And that's how they maintained and got their money uh, to prosper. They were looking to build the railroad through a city uh, in Kansas. And they had the cities uh, bid for the property and Nicodemus raised about $16,000 in bonds uh, for that purpose. And then from that, they added about two or $3,000 to generate $20,000 to get the railroad to come and build a railroad station. But the town to the west and the town to the east could raise only about three or $4,000 so they combined their money. So the railroad went through, railroad went through uh, that town to the east. It went around Nicodemus and it didn't stay in Nicodemus and it just finished in the town to the west. And that was where the railroad uh, denied Nicodemus the prosperity that it was entitled to as a, as, a, as a growing town. And when the railroad didn't go through Nicodemus, it, it started dying at that time. And this was about the 1870s, 1890s. So it, it, it's been dying uh, consistently since that time. And the railroad uh, was the downfall so people stopped coming to Nicodemus and that uh, meant that they couldn't provide for the town through the rent and through the taxes of the taxpayers. And it kind of died. But lo and behold, about 20 or 30 years ago, uh, there was oil on that land uh, that the Nicodemus, res Nicodemus residents could rely on and they prospered just to their, their benefit and there are about 15 to 20 families around that still reside in Nicodemus. And uh, Mr. Napew uh, went back there to his family and we met his family and, and saw their residence. It's kind of like the house behind it that we were talking about. So Nicodemus, Kansas is now a shell of a town that it was. And there are many stories that we can talk about. At this time, I'm going to introduce uh, Chuck Smith, who's the director of the play Flying West uh, that he produced. I think he had another production of Flying West earlier in time. And uh, 
uh, Jim Weaver, who was the education person from uh, the West Coast Black Theater. Uh, if Linda could spot them, we can talk to them about the Nicodemus play, uh, their production of Nick Flying West. And, and they can talk about the theatrical productions and uh, what inspired Nate to bring the Flying West to uh, the West Coast Black Theater. And if that is the thing we're going to do now, I'll stop sharing my screen and we can have them. Put on their show. On my screen, Jim Weaver is the bottom third and Chuck is the top third. And I think the first question I'll ask to Jim is as the educational director, do you think Flying West accurately portrays uh, Nicodemus, Kansas, or are there dramatic licenses taken? Or what is the basis for the decision to produce Flying West uh, in the West Coast Black Theater? Well, first let me say hi, it's an honor to be here with you today. And um, in all honesty, when Nate Jacobs, the artistic director, decided to mount um, Flying West for the theater, it fits right in with the, um, the mission statement, the goal of the theater, and that is to share the African-American experience and to share history and to bring things that may not normally be spoken about back into the light. And so I honestly had not read the play before. I was familiar with the title. And when I found out that we were doing it for the season, of course, I read it. And it fit like a glove. Because for me, it was a matter of actually being taught, learning something that I was not aware of previously. And so his decision to bring it to the theater, I thought was absolutely brilliant to let us have that platform and to have that information brought back out for us. Um, you and I had had a previous conversation and I let you know that you know, I'm a product of the New York City public school system. And all of my classes, going to college and taking various courses, undergrad, grad, and all that kind of stuff, and taking courses in reference to the African-American experience. And this never once came up. And I was absolutely shocked that this is a major portion of our history that really is just not discussed that often. And so for me, I thought it was absolutely wonderful to be able to, at this age, still learn and to have Chuck Smith there as the director to bring this to life. And yes, there are, um, I think, moments of artistic license in the piece because we're dealing with, um, without having actually biographical information, we're dealing with a fictionalized story of a family in that setting but also within the piece, there are definite elements of truth brought out. And I'm sure Chuck can speak more to that as well. But it's just, I think apropos for a playwright to be able to, because you want to engage your audience. So there has to be some um, permission given for artistic license, but within that is also an educational piece for us. I knew Mr. Nate Pugh uh, and his family for about 15 years. We and I, he and I went to the same church in Lincoln, Nebraska. And I was saying, you know, every July it seemed he wasn't here for, for Bible study or a Sunday school. And I, I was concerned because he's getting up in years. So I said, Mr. Nate Pugh, where are you going? And you're always coming back happy. He said, I'm, I'm going home. I, I said, where is home? He said, Nicodemus, Kansas. And I said, well, I don't go to New York every weekend, you know, so what's so special about Nicodemus, Kansas? He said it was an all black community that was thriving, that had uh, potential. Uh, they were farmers. They were all formerly enslaved people as a genesis for uh, Nicodemus. And they were just trying to live a better life uh, after the reconstruction, after the Jim Crow, after the Civil War. So I, I said, you know, I, I've got to go. Linda and I have to go. So the next time he went back for his homecoming, 
because that weekend was was the, the uh, emancipation weekend for years, and the 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 homecoming was for people from Nicodemus or people who knew about Nicodemus or people who wanted to learn about Nicodemus. So we were enthralled and we took, you know, three days and we had uh, ribs. We had, uh, uh, I, want, I want to say chitlins, but not chitlins, but it was that homecoming, home cooked meals that, that we remember. And they had trucks, you know, that served tacos and all that stuff. But Linda and I, we went home to, to, to that, that restaurant and got authentic Southern cooking in Kansas. But, you know, theatrically, uh, Chuck, is this the first production of, of Flying West that you did? Or no, did you, it's, you did it's the earlier? second. I did, I did a production. Uh, I'm in Chicago right now. And yeah. uh, this, I'm born and raised in Chicago. And I did a production here in Chicago right before the pandemic. And, uh, but I know about, I, I, I knew about Nicodemus because uh, years ago when I, uh, I was on a fellowship in, uh, in the early 90s, 90, 91. And, uh, and part of the fellowship uh, took, me, uh, took me to uh, St. Louis for a, a class at the university, I think it's Washington University in St. Louis. And uh, Gene Early, a historian, he talked about uh, this uh, westward migration of uh, black settlers coming from from Kentucky, mainly a lot from a lot of from Kentucky, and going to Kansas, and they were called at the time uh, the Exodusters, and. Uh, I knew nothing about this, you know, again, uh, uh, like Jim was saying, he, he was educated in New York City. I was educated here in the city of Chicago, but nobody ever told me about this. You know, here I am, grown man, think I know pretty much of everything, halfway educated, and I knew nothing about this. So uh, being in theater, I thought, you know what, this, this might make a good play. So. Uh, when I got uh, back to Chicago off from that, uh, I was on a fellowship and I, when I got back to Chicago off the fellowship, I put it, I submitted it to the Goodman Theater where I work right now and in my Goodman Theater office right now and said, look, I got, I got this great idea for a play. And I wrote it all down about Nicodemus. So they said, yeah, that'd be pretty cool. So believe it or not, Nicodemus is what got me my job here at the Goodman Theater. And I've been here 30 years. Anyway, they say, okay, why don't you go and do some research? And so they, they, they gave me a budget. I went and uh, went to Kentucky where I, I found out a lot of these people were, were, uh, had started from and drove the route that they took. But they were on a route, believe it or not, they caught the train and the train dumped them off in the middle of nowhere. And this is the story I heard now. Dump, dump them off, and the Indians helped them out, get the, the, help them get through the winter. That that group that, you know, that I knew about. Uh, I went. I think I was there around. I'm pretty sure I was there around ho homecoming. It was in July. And uh, I was surprised that I didn't. I thought I thought I'd see a bustling town. It's not a bustling town. And so they, they told me the story about, uh, about the railroad. They were expecting the railroad to come through Nicodemus and that was gonna help them out. But the, it didn't come through Nicodemus. If politics or whatever, the train went through Bogue, which is near Nicodemus, but not Nicodemus. And so that, again, like you said, that's the downfall of, of the town. Flying West could also, you know, uh, if you want to give it a subtitle, you might think of it as Sophie's Dream. Sophie is the main, one of the main characters in, 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 in Nicodemus. And she talks about, you know, if, if, if the people could just get together and there'd be black folks farms and black folks this and all as far as the eye could see, 
you know, and but I don't think it's that way anymore. I don't think it's black folks as far as the eye could see in Nicodemus. It, it, you know, as far as from what I from you know the, from where it lo looks like to me, it wasn't it wasn't like that. It's a very sort of integrated town and mostly white folks, which is you know that's the way that's the way the world works. It, and she says, you know, in the play you hear about speculators. You know, they. I guess, hey, if if the people couldn't make it on the land, and somebody coming and offered them X, Y, Z, say, look, I'll give you so much money. Now, to, uh, what I, my question is, uh, Mr. Crump, how much was five dollars worth in today's money? In 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 the, in the time of uh, uh, back in the uh, late 1860s. I have no idea, and I'm hazarding a guess that five dollars couldn't buy you a square of land much less an acre of land. So, you know, you know it, it's, I'm guessing, you know, $1,000, $2,000. Okay, yeah, all right. So, I mean, that is a lot of money. They had to put the $5 down just to get, you know, a lot on them to work the land. And if you stayed there five years, then, then it's yours, okay? So, hey. They, you know, I mean, I, I can, one can understand why, you know, if, if they weren't getting any help at all. And in the play, it says, you know, uh, people that came out there, they didn't have, they had no, well, yes, a lot of them were farmers, but they didn't have nothing to farm with. And they had nothing to buy it with. And you you're not talking about people with, with training in terms of, uh, they, 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 most of them even probably couldn't even read. So you're talking about you're talking about a, a bunch of poor people with yes, with skills in farming, but have never been there on, on their own in terms of knowing how to uh, how how to earn them how to earn a living in terms of you know making money and and once you once once you once you got your farm whatever you planted. And farmed. Who's going to buy it? How you, no, none of those skills were available to them. So it was kind. Of, I mean, it, I, I could one could see easily how how would how it went bad for them, and how yeah, a lot of them went out there, but a very few stayed. And uh, I uh, uh, again, I, I'm sorry. I'm I'm sad to see. I wish Sophie's dream had come true. To see black folks farms and black folks towns townships as far as the eye can see that was her dream and now uh, that that never happened but it is again the whole point the point about history is why don't why, why come people don't you know you, you hear in the movies that you you get you get cowboys all the westerns how many black you don't see blacks you know where you more now you do but when I grew up, I mean, I didn't see no black folks in, in the in the cowboy pictures as we used to call them. You know, go to the cowboy movies on Saturday. You didn't see no black people. You know, like we we're we're no part of it, none at all. Yeah, you know? I, I remember, true. I remember back in New York City, Jim, going to school and learning about American history, and I learned about American history, but relevant to to, to this issue, it, this issue. They always talked about manifest destiny. It was in the United States' best interest to go out there and homestead this land, not knowing or not believing that it belonged to anybody, but it all belonged to the American, the Native Americans. So we, they, they, they don't teach about that part of it. They teach about the good, noble, manifest destiny, destiny going forward, claiming this land, homesteading this land, and it's yours. It, it, it's yours if you if you work it, but it doesn't say about you work it by killing the American Indian or sending the American Indian somewhere else. So uh, Flying West doesn't talk about that in that area. They talk about the blacks who were enslaved or moving at the in, at the invitation of somebody putting on a poster to say for five dollars, put it down, work it. It's yours. And then the, the railroad it was building up to the sit up to the towns, but there wasn't anything there to hold them there. After it became obvious that manifest destiny wasn't working for the Indian, it wasn't working for the enslaved African, 
and Nicodemus has become a history, except to the people who live there who still maintain Nicodemus as a history. Well, as you're, as you're saying this, you know, the thought that comes to mind is that, um, for lack of another way to say it, those that are in charge or the conquerors are the ones that get to tell the story. Right. You know, so a lot of what you're talking about is are things that, you know, it, it almost didn't matter to a certain extent. That's not the story. That's not the narrative that they want out there, no. you know, but you could take that in terms of expanding out to the West and you could just take that whole scenario and expand it to the entire continent if you want, you know, because it was about taking control, taking ownership expanding financial aspects, you know, economic aspects and being able to um, take advantage of the various elements and oil and all those kinds of things to consolidate the um, United States itself, but at the sacrifice at the expense of the others who were already here or those that were brought over forcibly you know, built upon the backs of those folks, but that's not something that's really talked about or taught, at least not when I was going through school in New York, and I assumed for Chuck in Chicago, you know, right. that was not a part of the history that was taught no. because it did put people in the best light. Right. Well, I've heard from a, 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 a historian buddy of mine. He says, history is a family story. And if you're not in the family, <laughs> you're not in the story. So <laughs> that I makes like that. all the sense in the world to me. I get it. I mean, yeah. I, and I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it's 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 obvious to all of us, and, and and we all know this by now. Know this now that we got to tell our own. We we got to make our. We got to tell our stories because ain't nobody else gonna tell them for us. You know, we got to tell our own stories, and that's one of the wonderful things about. Black theater that I love, you know, we tell our stories, and uh, I have a ball telling stories like uh, like Flying West. I mean, I I just relish in it, you know, because people learn something. People of all races learn a thing or two when they see a play like Flying West, and I just love to watch their faces. Some of them are shocked. Some of yeah, that's but it happened. The fact of the matter is, yes, yeah, there is a lot of, uh, not, I can't say a lot of uh, dramatic license in the play. The play is, 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 is fiction, you know? And uh, the one thing that's wrong in the play is that Nicodemus did not have a train station, you know? And in the play, we got a, we got a train station with a Nicodemus sign behind it. No, that didn't happen. That, that sign should say Vogue. That's what it should say, you know, but I couldn't convince the set designer to do that. And once it was made, I had to deal with it. Plus, but I'm, she didn't, she says they go to the train station, but they didn't, uh, she doesn't say she, in the play, Pearl Clegg doesn't say we go going to the Nicodemus train station. She didn't say we're going to the train station. Well, the train station was in Vogue. The, pain, the train station was not in Nicodemus. Nicodemus did not have a train station, you know. And I, See, but that, I mean, that's I, about, that's about doing your research. Yes, yeah, it is, it is. It Chuck, is. Can, can I ask you a question, Chuck? Can you explain or, or tell us about the first play that you produced for Flying West, what you learned, and when you, your second play, was it the same play? Was it, was it modified somewhat? Was there a difference? No, the exact same play, exact, exact same play. Uh, we uh, as 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 directors uh, and 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 theater companies, uh, the play was th this. This is not a new play. This is a very old play. This play is thirty years old. That was one. That was another reason why the, the piece that I, the the play I was trying to put together never happened. And the, the main reason why it never happened because this play was already out. And this was, this is a good play, you know, for to try to tell another Nicodemus story, which can, which can happen and somebody's gonna do it. But you know, I just hey, no, you know, this is, this, 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 we already got a good Nicodemus play out here. So what, you know, so I mean, anyway, mine fell through, but I, I got the job anyway, I'm still here. So <laughs> oh, it's all good. But uh, uh, 
Yeah, I lost my point. I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, I, we were just asking, can you contrast to both plays? Oh, both plays. Was, yeah. was it done in the round or? No, it was, or? It, uh, it's, it, it was done straight per senior, which means uh, uh, all the audiences, just the stage Basic. was is in front. In, in, this, in this production, you got audiences on three sides. That's another problem because a lot of, for, fortunately or unfortunately, whatever the case may be, the uh, the people on audience right can't see the Nicodemus sign, so, but they can't see they can see the people on stage. So, that's to me that that sort of cooled it out for me a little bit. You know, so I, I feel sorry for those people over there because it's not a good seat. You don't see as much as you should see in this play, but you do miss the Nicodemus sign, and that's the only thing I didn't particularly enjoy about about the play you know is the nicodemus sign was this was the sign in the first play no 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 we you you go to the train station but it doesn't say where you go to the train station you know it doesn't say that he said well he said i'm going into town and uh well he could have been going into nicodemus he said, but when it when it whenever they refer to the train station, they didn't they, they never say where the train station was in the play. You know, she doesn't say it's it's it the the train station is in the town of Nicodemus. That is not in the play, you know. So, you know. Jim. But it's uh, the same play. Yeah, the same play. It's the exact same play that she wrote 30 years ago. Yeah. And she's still writing today. We're gonna uh, produce an, uh one of her plays uh as part of our next season. Her new, her, her latest work, and uh, I'm gonna su uh, su surround it with a little festival here at the, at the Goodman Theater in Chicago, but, uh, and I'm pretty sure I'm gonna do a reading of uh, a Flying West since it is, one of my favorites of hers. Yeah. Jim, do you do you get goosebumps when Flying West is produced here in uh, in uh, West Coast Black Theater in your in your uh, endeavors as the education director, does it get your juices going that you can go out in the community or get children involved? Or what do you look for to do for the education for Flying West? Oh yeah, it really does. Like, you know, as I was saying earlier, this is a bit of history that I knew nothing about. And so that's part of my mission and it's part of the mission of West Coast to enlighten folks and especially as the director of education to get students, we actually do provide some free tickets for students to come and see, usually a matinee because that works out best in terms of their school schedule and stuff like that. But that's, that's the point. That is the point is to share our history and keep it going, keep it in the light. So does it get my juices going? Oh yeah. <laughs> Can you explain what you're doing Monday for Voices for the West Coast Black Theater? Oh, yeah. It's one, one of the things that's under my umbrella. It's called the Voices Program, where we get to talk about sometimes topical, sometimes controversial, educational things that are happening around us or in the news. And in this case, because we've got Flying West happening on the main stage, and Chuck has graciously agreed to be part of that too. He's going to zoom in again from Chicago. But we will be talking about um, Nicodemus and the play and the history behind how the westward expansion happened, the exodusters and all of that. And that's on Monday. The difference is that we actually do this live in the theater. It's free. All we ask you to do is go to the website for westcoastblacktheater.org and just register. So it gives us an opportunity to talk to people about the play and we're gonna have the um, props designer there. We're gonna have two of the actors there and Gene Crump, you have graciously agreed to be there as well. And so we're gonna get all the different aspects around the piece itself, but it's gonna be done in front of a live audience and people will get to actually ask us questions and hear opinions about that happening. And that's on Monday. Thank you. Linda, I, I think we're about done with our part of the program. I think it's time yeah. to let the audience ask questions or comments. 
There are a few that have come in while you guys were talking, and uh, one that I thought of myself too, since I've been to Nicodemus. One of the things I really enjoyed was the older woman, tell me her name again, her character name. Uh, uh, Miss Leah. Miss Leah, that Miss Leah only wanted to orally tell her stories because when we went to Nicodemus, in that town hall that was built in 1939, that's where people gathered and orally told their stories. And that oral tradition was so great. Can you talk a little bit about the beauty of oral tradition? Any of you? Well, I enjoy going back when I did to hear my grandmothers because I had I, I grew up in a, in a strange house. I had three sets of grandparents. I didn't understand that my father's parents divorced and separated because I had grandparents in St. Louis, grandparents in Sandusky, Ohio, and grandparents in Mississippi. And I enjoyed spending time with them. And I realized now that I have children, sometimes we have to send the children away to have a life of our own. But I enjoyed enjoyed meeting with my grandparents and my aunts and my uncles, talking about things that I wish I would have taken notes on. And there's one, there's one aunt from my mother's generation who lives in Chicago that will go there and visit. Hopefully we'll stop by the Compton Goodman and, and try to get the best genealogy we can. Uh, my grandfather told us uh, about our, uh, my grandparent on my father's side told us about how life was in Arkansas and Mississippi and in St. Louis. And so I, I enjoy the oral aspect of learning history, but you have to take the time to take it down and record it. But if you don't mind my kind of dovetailing off of that, this actually goes way back to Africa, the griots, and how there were people in the villages who were responsible for the history of the families and the village itself and life. And it was their job to pass that information on. It was like they were the book, they were the library, and they would share that. And I love the fact that being brought over here by force, it's things that stay with you. It's just ingrained, it's just part of your DNA. And so that's where that actually comes from. And that whole oral tradition came over with us on the boats and it's yeah. still with us today. Yeah, there's a there's a great, great section in the uh, Alex Haley's Bio, uh, bio, uh, about when he uh, he went to Africa, oh, and you. the griots were telling the story, and it got down to where his family was 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 mentioned, and he said it 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 all it 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 just sent sent all those chills right through him. You know, there's there's the line. That's his family line. And I mean, he said the guy went on for hours and then he got to his, got to, got, got to his people. So it, was, it was amazing, you know. Uh, it's one of, one, of, one of my favorite parts of that, that, that story, that, that book that, that he, you know. Yeah. Um, in the chat too, we've had someone who's wanted to give away some of the place. So I'm not going to give that away. So Bob, sorry about that. You're not going to get that answer today. But um, one of the things that was asked <laughs> no, don't, don't, Bob, give it, don't give it away. I know, no. we're not giving anything away. Yeah. Was the, is it really possible that just a lack of a railroad would actually be the reason for a town to decline? Yes, because it, uh, uh, it, it, stopped, it, stopped, it, it stopped the people from coming. It stopped their, you know, it, 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 that was... That was that was going to be their 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 lifeline. They were they were declining at the time, and what they needed was new fresh blood coming in there, new new people bringing in resources, and and they said no, we're gonna we're gonna put the we're gonna now we're not gonna take the train through Nicodemus. We're gonna take it through Bogue. Bogue is not a black town, you know. Well, so when you think about it at the time it was still being developed, everything out there. There were no main roads. There were, that was going to be the quickest way to get equipment and people and make it so much easier for people to get to Nicodemus or any place out West. And to deliberately choose to go around it, you're basically saying, we are not gonna make life easy for you. We are yeah. not gonna make it easy for you to get supplies. 
We are not going to make it easy for people to get to you so that the restaurants and hotels can have some economic growth. So all of those things made a major difference. So yeah. And folks, when they realized that that was not going to happen, that they were not going to be able to sell the crops from the farms or have hotel guests coming in or have restaurants flourishing, they were losing money. So folks started leaving. So another question, can you, or is a comment, can you tell us a little bit about the playwright? Anything about her background? And Well, she, uh, she, she's not only a playwright, she's a, she's a, she's a, she's an author, period. She writes poetry. She writes uh, essays, novels. One of her novels was uh, selected by, uh, by Oprah as the, her book of the, whatever, whatever, the book of the year, the book of the month, or oh, one of, you know, that's how I met her because she came to Chicago. Oprah was in Chicago at the time. And I was doing uh, one of Pearl Clegg's plays, uh, Blues for an Alabama Sky. And so Pearl came through the theater. I was in rehearsal and uh, we got, that's how we, that's, and that's how I met her. But she was here, Oprah got brought her here to introduce her book as the book of the month or the, whatever that book thing that, that Oprah has. And so she's a well-known writer. And uh, again, uh, this year, uh, or yeah, it'll be this fall when we produce our latest play, we're going to uh, surround it with a, with a festival of her, of her literature, not only her plays, but also her, her poetry and also her essays and, and selections from novels that she's written. Uh, Chuck, without giving too much away, what is the story of the new play? Just a synopsis. I don't know. I haven't read it yet. I'm not. I'm not directing it. Oh, I'm just right. going to direct the. I'm going to work on the festival. Okay. <laughs> we all have different roles. We have about three minutes left, and what I'd like to do, if there's anybody in the audience who didn't put something in a chat who would like to say something, I'm going to remove the spotlights on these guys so we can see somebody. And then you can just go ahead and raise your hand and we'll go ahead and try to answer your questions when we get all the spotlights removed. It takes a little bit of time. You got to be the last one, Jim. <laughs> Okay, so if anybody wants to ask a question or something, raise their hand. I see that the Taylor household has their hand up. Uh, just a just a comment and a uh, to put a little per, per perspective in things. Uh, I could tell that the that the actors and actresses in in this presentation were really getting it. Uh, their their acting skills just really touched my 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 heart and i was amazed at how wonderfully they really portrayed that uh, also when you talk about something like the railroad uh, affecting things i think about gary indiana where, where i grew up when when u.s steel was there and and the white folks were there it was a thriving town but when u.s steel succumbed to the uh, to the to the pressures of the economy all of the resources left left town and you can see uh, the, the struggles that we had at, at, as a city. So all these things relate to me and I am, I am very much moved by this presentation today. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so I just, uh, I, just to piggyback on what he was saying, the talent pool that you guys have found to put on this play here in Sarasota is just amazing. Can you tell us a little bit about how you ended up finding all of those wonderful actors right here? Did you have to import some? Uh, from Yes, some are imported, but uh, you are absolutely correct. I've been coming, I've been uh, coming to Sarasota uh, since uh, the winter of 1450 and uh, when uh, uh, I've been, and I've been coming back ever since to direct when, uh, every winter, whenever I, whenever I can. The, the pandemic slowed me down, but that was it. But uh, uh, since I've been here, the talent pool has grown about 200% in terms of the ability to, to find good actors. Now what's, what's missing is that 
you find good actors, but you don't have enough to find good understudies. Oh. You know, so we have to keep our fingers crossed that nothing seriously happens because we don't have the the, the enough to to go around for understudies. You know, so that's I the next that's the next step. Thank you. I hate to say that our time is up. And what we typically do is we'll have David stop the recording. But if anybody wants to stay on, wants to chit chat, wants to ask questions, just be respectful of the, their time. I would guess, Jim, you're missing a board meeting right now, aren't you? Uh, actually, yeah. But, um, <laughs> besides that, there's also a, a little bit of a technical rehearsal to prepare for Monday for the right. Voices program. So I'm kind of triple dipping right now. <laughs> and and I, I'm willing to stay on for a few more minutes if anybody has any questions, you know, for me. And we're going to put it in the, Right. Okay.